in Joshua. We ended in Joshua 6 and 7. Now, Josh has covered some of this, but I wanted to stop and talk about something um, powerful and important. And Tom, I'm going to ask, just bring me down just a little bit because I'm going to start shouting really loud. So Joshua 6, then they burned the whole city of Jericho and everything in it. This is an interesting place to start. But remember, they marched around the city seven times, one time a day. And on the seventh day, they did it seven times. I shared with you the story of Lighthouse and the schoolhouse. And, and it's now a new image in our church. You've got to buy the schoolhouse before you get to the lighthouse. And that means you've got to start somewhere. Amen? When God says do it, start where he says do it. You don't know where it's going to end. Just start. We don't have a long-range plan. Joshua's plan is be bold, be courageous, and do what I tell you. And so part of that was to enter Jericho. And when the wall came down, they entered the city, and they took everything in it, and it was devoted to God. The silver and the gold, the articles of bronze and iron, they put it into the treasury of the Lord's house. But Joshua spared, the one person spared from the city was Rahab, who when the spies scouted the city, Rahab said, I know God is at work, save my life. And she showed kindness to them. She hid the spies. She helped them escape. And for that, they said, we'll save you, but you've got to be in this room. And Rahab gathered everybody she could in that room. Rahab seized the opportunity to be saved. And so she was spared. She was saved with her family. It didn't matter that she was a prostitute. It didn't matter what she did. It absolutely mattered what she did, but, but not who she was. What mattered is she saw God at work and she joined it. And it saved her. And all who belong to her. Verse chapter 7 begins this way. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Devoted means things devoted to be destroyed or to be put in the treasury. They were not devoted to be owned by any Israelite. Achan of the tribe of Judah, or Achan, took some of them. So this one dude decides that, well, yeah, I know what that's about, but I'm going to take some things for myself. Now, Joshua doesn't know this has happened. Here's how they find out. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai to go up and spy out the region. When they returned, Joshua said, when, when they returned, basically they said to Joshua, it's not such a big place, just send some of the men. And so Joshua sends some of the men. So about 3,000 went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed 36 of them. And this is interesting. Israel is coming into a land that has been told for 400 years to stop killing their children, for 400 years to get right with God. For 400 years they've been warned about judgment, and they have not responded, and they're about to be wiped out. In the same way, Israel will be carted off and wiped out. In, in other words, th there is this universal sense of what God is up to. There's justice and there's punishment and there's days of reckoning. And the Israelites are bringing this day of reckoning to the people of the land. And they're doing it so well that when 36 Israelites get killed, it's a big deal. But something's wrong. God has been using them and this time they got routed. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. As the hearts of the people melted in fear because of this and became like water. So Joshua, their leader, tore his clothes, fell face down on the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same. They sprinkled dust on their heads. They were, they were disheveled in grief. They, they thought they were walking in God's plan and suddenly they've been stopped and they don't know why. And Joshua said, Alas, sovereign Lord, why did, we, why did you bring us across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we'd been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. These are just the stupid prayers we pray, aren't they? And, and he goes on, Pardon your servant, Lord, what can I say that now that Israel has been routed by its enemies? The Canaanites, this sounds like Moses, some of Moses' prayers. The Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this. They'll surround us. They'll wipe out our name from the earth. What will you do for your own great name? He's having a panic attack. The Lord said to Joshua, get up. What are you doing down on your, your face? Israel has sinned. You violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They've taken some of the... And interesting, it doesn't say Achan is sin. It's, it's Israel's sin. Interesting. They've taken some of the devoted things. They've stolen. They've lied. They've put them with their own possessions. They've mingled what was meant for the Lord for themselves. 
That's why the Israelites can't stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they've been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. This is a powerful sentence. The presence of God in this case is tied to righteousness. And sin always breaks fellowship with God. Amen? Have you had that experience? When I know the thing I should do and I don't do it, I know as a fact that, the, that there's something between me and the Lord. And it, it begins to destroy. It's the same as a kid. If my dad said, bring the car home at 10 with gas in it, and it's 1130, and I'm, I'm, I'm just, there's no gas in it, okay? I'm 18 years old. I know I got a meeting in the morning. And there's something wrong between me and my dad till I make it right. And it always leads to death, this sin. At the very least, it's death in a relationship. If I don't fix it, my dad can't trust me, and I lose the right to the car. That's just a simple picture. It gets much deeper in our lives. Sin is never overlooked. Achan has done this, but it's hurting all of Israel. Sin always needs punishment. It's never not punished. That's why we have a cross. I mean, people have said, George Carlin used to joke about, you know, what if Jesus was electrocuted? Would we be wearing ele uh, electric chairs around our, you know, which is sort of a snarky, but there's truth in that. Yeah. That's a death device. It's just one that brought life because of what, who Jesus was, amen, not because of how he was killed. Sin is never overlooked. Sin will be is punished. There's not one sin that won't be punished. And we, when we preach grace in the evangelical church, we can't soft pedal sin. It needs confessed and forsaken. So, so here's what the Lord says to Joshua. Go consecrate the people. Consecrate means set them apart. Consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow, for this is what the Lord of God of Israel says. There are devoted things among you, Israel. You can't stand against your enemies until you remove them. Now, Israel always stands for a type. They're a word picture in reality. It's not just an example. It's more than that. It's a real thing. From Israel, we learn the character of God. Things apply differently on this side of Easter. Nothing has changed categorically. But we're going to talk about this. But bear with this. Understand this for a minute. And so Joshua says, uh, through the Lord, through Joshua, the Lord says, in the morning present yourselves tribe by tribe. The tribe the Lord chooses shall come forward clan by clan. The clan the Lord chooses shall come forward family by family. The family the Lord chooses will come forward man by man. There's a way they had of doing this to where they would seek the Lord and he would show them tribe, family, clan. And whoever is caught with a devoted thing shall be destroyed by fire along with all that belongs to him. He's violated the covenant of the Lord. He's done an outrageous thing in Israel. So he announces this and, and, and Achan is sitting by his tent hearing this thinking, oh man. I mean, it's funny, but it ain't funny, right? The... Comedy is just sort of tragedy in time, right? So, wow, I, I sure hope that doesn't get to me. Probably won't, will it? Now, what if you lived under this edict? Here's, here's, here's the tension for today. What if you lived where, cause, cause, what if we knew what you did last night or two nights ago? Or how you're running your books or your bank accounts. What if it was all public? Every one of us would be in the seat of Aachen, wouldn't we? Amen? Are you with me? Oh, man, if, 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 my, if they find out Tyler, yikes. Not you, me. Right? If, if, if there's a way that every day this stuff could come to light, we'd all be in trouble. So what if we lived under this edict? Do we? The fact is we do. We just understand what grace is. The opposite of grace is when we just assume on God and pretend it's not real or serious. That's how powerful grace is. 
Jesus knows that we have the heart of Aachen. And while being killed by assembled Aachens, he said, Father, forgive them, and did for us, otherwise we'd all be dead. That's how powerful what we celebrate at Easter is. Early the next morning, Joshua had Israel come forward by tribes. Judah was chosen. The clans of Judah came forward. The Zerites were chosen. The Zerites came forward. Zimri was chosen. Joshua had his family come forward by man by man. And Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was chosen. You can be sure, says the scripture, that your sin will find you out. And there he stands, isolated, exposed. Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and honor him. Tell me what you've done. Don't hide it from me. And Achan replied, it's true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I've done. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, five pounds of silver and a bar of gold weighing 20 ounces, I coveted them and took them. They're hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. There it is. He confesses. Now note the progression of his sin and tell me you're not Aachen. I saw. There's no sin in seeing. Though we have a bunch of songs that sing, I wish I was blind. Because we know that it's more than seeing. The second thing he says is, when I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe, five pounds, see he's weighing it already in his mind. He's letting it linger. He's calling it beautiful. He's worshiping it with his eyes and what I call his feels. Right? He's letting it sink. What's the difference between David and uh, Joseph in the Bible? Joseph had a woman tear off his clothes and say, come to bed with me. Joseph ran away. He fled. David saw Bathsheba and he lingered. David, David took the neck. Nothing wrong with seeing. Unless you're trying to see. The problem is when we let it linger. And worse, he says, I coveted. So not only did I think about it, <clears throat> and, and there are degrees to sin, folks. But he coveted it. He made a decision not with his feels, but with his mind. He, he wanted it in his, oh, that'd be nice. I sure would like that five pounds of gold or silver. But then he coveted it with his mind. Oh, I know how to get it. I can just take it. He worshiped with his will, not just his feels. And then I took. So I saw, I lingered, I coveted, I took to myself as my own, and I disregarded the clear command of the Lord. Now, you, you tell me that's not how sin works in your life. That's how it works in all of our lives. It's just our things are different. A beautiful robe, who cares? In, in, insert the thing you find beautiful. It could be an image, it could be uh, an, an addictive substance, it could, be, it could be a beautiful robe. I know a lot of people, man, since COVID, they're, all they're doing is watching things on TV and buying stuff that they can't afford or don't need. There's so many things that capture us that we think, oh, that'll bring me a moment of happiness. And what's, what's bizarre about sin is we, we, we stimulate our brain with it, but it's just, it's just a couple of pounds of crap. And yet we're willing to, to walk away from what God has for us. And it's a bad trade. It's always a bad trade. And why I've been stopped here in the book of Joshua is because here it is. It's so plain to us. And it cost Achan his life. It cost Jesus his life. Sin is serious. So Joshua sent messengers. They went. They found everything. And they stoned this man to death. And with his stuff. Why have you brought this trouble on us, they said. The Lord will bring trouble on you today. When Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's taking on this trouble for us. But we just, I, it just, the love I have for Jesus makes me sick at the sin of Achan in my life. How about you? What are we going to do about it? Well, Israel stoned him because it's serious and sin will always lead to death. Is there a death covering your sin? Do you have a valley of trouble 
The valley of Achor was a valley of trouble. Where's your... I, I say, do you have? I know you have. Do you know you have? Where's your valley of trouble? Where's your besetting sin? Where's that thing that would make you know, yes, Lord, I'll do that, but it draws you away. Don't take it to yourself. I know, but there's just this little bit I want. It's that brokenness. And, and, and when we succumb to it, we're, we're pulled out of fellowship. God doesn't want us out of fellowship. Who of us would survive this level of righteousness? None of us. We are under this level of righteousness. That's why Jesus gave his blood. If anybody asks why did Jesus bleed on the cross, it's so that we wouldn't be under a pile of stones like Achan. Amen? And that's the love of God. People indict God. They say he's judgmental. How can you say God is judgmental when he's just and he sends the payment for that? So what compels us to change? Fear? What compels us to confess? Healthy fear? Love? Hey, fear is okay as a motivation. It just doesn't last forever. What should compel us is the love of God. He doesn't want you to die. He's warning you. He's calling you and me to confess sin. He wants to be in fellowship with us. He wants that fellowship restored. He doesn't want that distance. In the New Testament, Jesus preaches about a son who said to the father, give me what's mine, you're dead to me, and runs away. And the father never stops caring. And the father is ready. As soon as the son realizes, oh my, I'm aching, turns around, or aching, turns around, there's the father to receive him. Jesus is the way the Father receives you. So what do we do when we fail like Peter? Peter failed. Peter knew everything about Jesus, but he denied him because he didn't want to die. And Jesus comes to Peter later, and what's the question? Do you love me? And here's the beauty. Jesus knows Peter loves him. He's trying to restore him. Peter needs to know he loves him. So much of my preaching anymore is the same thing, and it's this. Know how absolutely saved and love you are and live into it. Quit fighting it. Amen? The, the Holy Spirit wants in. There's the atmospheric pressure of the Holy Spirit pounding on you, saying, come, let me in. Let me have more and more of you. I am good. <clears throat> Stop fighting. <clears throat> See clearly. That's the beauty of this scripture today. So let's talk about sin. What is it? It's the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it. That's sin. It's missing the mark. It's the, it's the arrow. The Thomases, they don't miss. But I do. If I were to shoot an arrow, right? They don't miss. But if they miss, it's a sin. <laughs> Did you know that? That's what amartia means. There, there's, a, there's a bullseye and then there's not. And so much of our lives are not. There's separation and distance. That's another word for sin. Who sins? Romans 3. Yeah. And we fall short of the glory. I don't want to, I don't, I, I'm tired of how short I fall. Does it matter? The wage of sin is what? If anyone causes one of these little ones, Here's how serious sin is to Jesus, who believe in me to sin. It would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. Jesus said that. That's how, sin didn't get less serious. The New Testament is just the answer to sin. It never diminishes its deadliness. In fact, Jesus takes the law, thou shalt not commit adultery, and says, if you lust in your heart, you're an adulterer. The problem is the heart. It's the heart of Achan, who said, I know, I know, Lord, I know, but I, I want that for me. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Do something about sin. So in the evangelical church, we don't want to diminish sin. That's why I demand we have a call to confession every Sunday in our, in our worship. You don't just come here to feel good. You come here to do business with the one who loves you. And, and, and it's, it's, the, it's I, thou. You're God, not me. I need you. You're the forgiver of my sin. Thank you. I never want to lose this basis. And we're constantly 
giving this over to Jesus. Now, once we're saved, we're saved. So what is this? This is about a relationship. Are we going to walk closely with the Lord? Are we going to grow up and be adult believers? Or are we going to stay children? If your eye causes you to sin, and I love it. These are the ways we sin. We sin with our hands. We sin with our eyes. We sin with our wills and our feels. And hell is a place. What do I do about sin? I believe. What? No, don't I confess? No. First, you've got to believe that God demonstrates his own, love, his own love for us this way, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Here's what you believe. I, I am saved by his grace, not by my behavior. Wait a minute, Kirk, you're talking about sin and you're saying sin has to be dealt with. Sin is dealt with on the cross. I believe that God did something for me that I couldn't do for myself, and he did it for Achan. Then I confess, not only that I believe and thank you, but I'm a sinner. Because if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Well, Achan got killed. That was then. Israel, Paul talks about this in Romans. Israel is a picture for our benefit. And somewhere in God's economy, Israel will be dealt with by Christ differently. In other words, they, they'll be saved through Jesus. But it points out the seriousness of sin. And it leads us to thanksgiving for the Savior. And He will forgive us our sins and purify us. If you confess to the Lord, Lord, I need you. I'm a sinner. I have the spirit of Achan in me. But you have made a way for me to be yours. I believe you will be saved. And you are saved. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Blessed is he whose transgression... This is the Old Testament, folks. This is David looking forward. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. Some of you right now have the heavy hand of the Lord. You're trying to hide it like Achan. And I'm saying, confess it. Achan finally confessed it, but you're confessing it in the age of, of the time of forgiveness is now. Don't die. Confess. Tell the Lord. I believe the Holy Spirit is opening up His church. And it always is accompanied. Revival is always led by confession of sin. When we get serious about not playing church, when we tell somebody else, you don't have to tell me, we're not going to put it in the paper, but, but some of you are hiding and you're afraid you're going to be exposed, and I'm saying, tell it to somebody. Confess it to God today. Take it to the Lord today. If you need to come up and kneel on this altar, kneel somewhere. Before the Lord. And then tell one person you can trust. One person who loves Jesus more than you. And who would not use it against you. But encourage you. You can tell me. You can tell staff here. You can tell a, a friend. and Become accountable to that person. Because if you don't, day and night, it just saps your strength. Amen? And there's not one person in this room don't you love that i'm preaching to the carpet there's not one person in this room who's not a sinner including your pastor amen we are the smudged we have ashes on our foreheads then i acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity i will confess my transgressions to the lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin you are more sinful than you realize and you are more saved than you realize. Go to the save side by confessing the sin. Let everyone who is godly, listen, they knew it in the time of David just as in the time of Jesus. Let everyone who is godly, chasing after God, who, who's received the, the gift of the Holy Spirit, let everyone who wants to be right with the Lord pray 
while you may be found. Surely when the mighty waters rise, they will not reach him. You're my hiding place. You'll protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. When you get to heaven in that great picture of revelation and, and uh, you stand in the place of Achan and surely my sin will be found out. It's not like your sin never happened. It's just that Jesus steps in and says that one is paid for. You, we never say we're not sinners. It's just our sin has been covered by the blood of Christ. And it makes me love him. And it makes me upset when I act as if I don't have this great treasure. And I trade it for five pounds of name your thing. Right? If we died with Christ, we believe that we live with him. Boy, let that sink in. If, if we let the bad news of our sin go to the grave with Jesus, the good news of his resurrection lives with us. We know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death had died. He died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin. So when you see, flee. You, you're not going to be perfect. You're, you're not going to perfect your way to heaven. But you are going to grow up. Amen? I'm talking to people that need to grow up. I'm preaching as one who needs to grow up. We're growing up. We're on the process. We are, we are receiving, responding, renewing, releasing, receiving, responding, renewing, releasing. We're washing our hair every day. The analogy dies because I'm losing my hair. There's got to be a better... The analogy is the tree. This is stuff for disciples, and I'm going to show you tools for disciples. It's tools for trees that are growing. And as you grow and more bark, and as you grow, the, the, the analogy... I wish we could be moving trees, but we're growing trees. And, and if an apple tree just keeps growing, it'll drop apples. Don't offer the parts of your body to sin, your mind your flesh, your will, your feels, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master because you are not under law. Isn't this interesting? Memorize this verse. Sin shall not be your master because you're not under law. Wait a minute, I thought sin was about law. It is, but the law has been satisfied, Christian. You're under grace. And, and here's the beauty now. When you receive it and confess and come to Christ, every step you take, even though you, every moment you live that out and forsake sin and have victory, even if there's struggle, even if there's a fallback, you have this thing called a testimony. This thing called an experience of his presence. You've tasted and seen his power of forgiveness. Why do you want to go back? And for the church to go forward, for God to be with the church in the United States, the church in America, the church in Paola, the Lighthouse Church, the church in you, for God to be there, this distance, this sin needs forsaken. Confess it. For that reason, I want fellowship closer. So here's our tools. You're, you, right now, you're at the workbench sharpening a tool. You're in worship. You're hearing the word. It's alive and living. It has the power to reform and bless you. Receive it as true. Receive the Spirit speaking to you right now, making your heart beat. Some of you are saying, I'm going to deal with this right now. You've got an, uh, an abiding sin, an addiction, something. God is showing you right now. Now's the day to do it. I'm telling you right now, make a note. Do something. Become accountable. Make a decision. What will you do? Worship. Praise, agreement, when, when we come in here to worship, that's what we're doing. We're agreeing with God. We're praising God. We're thanking God. We're responding and renewing. When we pray and confess our sin, we're responding to what's come to us. And we're just receiving deeply. And we're being renewed. Every time you confess your sins, you're being renewed. You're not being shamed. You're being youngered. Find fellowship and accountability. Find somebody. I'm, I'm capitalizing randomly, sorry. But um, 
These are tools. How do I become his? How do I grow up to be the tree he's called me to be? These are the things in your life. One of those things is confession. And and so I'm saying, go to the Lord today. Ron, I'm not sure. Are you leading the response time? Who's leading our response time today? Ron's going to give you an opportunity. I don't know what what will come of it. Here's what needs to come of it. Make a decision to confess your sin to the Lord. It can be it can be on the steps. It can be in your seat. It can be at home. But do it, and then tell somebody. Pray that God would show you that somebody, and come into fellowship with that person and accountability, and say because there's nothing to hide. Oh Father, free us. From hiding sin. Free us from fear. Help us to see your good. Help us to see how saved we are. I pray right now for that person who's trembling. They're so scared they're going to be found out. And what I'm asking is, is, is going to expose them. Father, break that down. You love them. The only thing in the way isn't your love. Lord, we're all prodigal sons. We're all prodigal daughters. Father, I just pray you cause your people to turn around and receive your embrace through confession. The son said, I'm not worthy, Lord. Just feed me from the table like a hired hand. And it was the Father's great pleasure to make him an heir. Everyone who confesses becomes a child of God. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen.